Good afternoon, everyone that's joined so far. A very warm welcome on a cold January morning to this, which is the first of a series of three cyber essential webinars run by Bernice Paul. Um, I am Hazel Moffat. I'm a partner at Bernice Paul, and I will be chairing this morning's session and the other two sessions, which I will remind you of at the end of this morning's webinar. We're joined today by two speakers. Uh, one is a, a fellow colleague of mine, Colin Hume, partner and head of our intellectual property practice, and Federico Chirosky, who is CEO and founder of Quorum Cyber Security. That's a specialist cyber defence company which works across all sectors in Scotland, the UK and beyond, helping organisations defend themselves against cyber threats and building up resilience. Today's session is intended to be relatively interactive. We have gone out to all delegates to ask them to send us any thoughts or questions in advance, which we will pick up during this morning's, this afternoon now session. Um, but also there's a chat box and I would really encourage you as the speakers are talking to pop down any questions or thoughts that you'd like us to try and pick up in the Q&A towards the end. And we'll do our best to cover all the points raised. And if we don't, we will come back to you individually. For those legal professionals with us today, obviously, please register and you will receive CPD. Always good news. And in terms of other housekeeping, you should all be on mute. Um, but if you aren't, please just check and mute yourselves while we are talking. Today's session is entitled Inside and Outside Threats. Um, and we're going to start with the outside threats first. So that will be Federico will, will talk first a little bit about what challenges there are out there for organisations, um, what's really going to be a, a threat to them. And then Colin will individually then deal with the inside threat. So that's threats posed by um, inside actors, disgruntled employees and so on. And so just to set the scene before I start my, my kind of dialogue and discussion with Federico, um, You'll all have seen over the Christmas holidays, there have been more cyber attacks, uh, more ransomware attacks, and we'll pick up in, in, in our discussion with Federico some of those points. But in terms of the stats, I mean, we're, we're surrounded by stats on, on cyber um, phishing scams, but, but here are a few, some of which are in the Microsoft um, Defence update report, which we'll come on to talk about too. But they really are staggering statistics. There is a cyber attack once every 37 seconds in the world. Um, there is 2,200 known and reported cyber attacks daily. In the UK alone, SMEs are targeted um, every day. Um, 65,000 attacks are targeted on SMEs every day, um, with about um, 10 to 12% of those actually being successful. Businesses in the UK have lost, 33% have lost customers over a cyber attack or a data breach. And the latest stats on ransomware in particular are saying that to recover from a ransomware attack, the average organisation will have to pay out at least £800,000. The Microsoft latest cyber defense report in particular talks about some of the issues around ransomware attacks, the fact that almost a third are successful and kind of successfully compromising your, your data and your systems. And so Frederico, just to start us off today, I wanted really to get your thoughts on how you see statistics like that. And, and importantly for delegates who dialed in today, what they're actually telling us, what they actually mean in terms of real risks to businesses and organisations, and really importantly, how, how they can prepare to, to fight and, and mitigate those risks. Uh, just a simple question, right, to, to start the day. Thanks, <laughs> just, start yeah, cool. just, yeah. just an easy one. <laughs> uh, look, uh, the, I, can't, I can't actually recommend enough that people take a look at the Microsoft Digital Defense Report for 2022, right? Because I think they've done a phenomenal work of, of collecting some really useful intel. Everybody probably attending will have to at some point build business cases. And sometimes it's hard to find reliable sources of statistics that aren't just fear mongering because they want to sell your product, right? Now you could argue being from a Microsoft perspective, there's always an, an, an intent there to try to articulate the problem. But, but I think given who they are, they have a bit more uh, gravitas in being able to share some of those statistics uh, just, just for the interest of sharing data, uh, as opposed to the kind of traditional fear mongering and certainly in doubt that the cyber industry is well known for, right? So uh, the other point is there is, a, there is an element of just the sheer volume 
of what they see. It, not a lot of people have access to that firsthand, right? So when even an, a, a company like Gardner or Forrester pull together reports, they are just collecting third-party information, right? And collecting it together and pulling statistics. Microsoft actually deals with the threat head on, right? So they defend things like SharePoint.com, Office, the 365, they Active Directory and Azure Active Directory, the, the, the sheer volume of the infrastructure of what they see themselves being attacked is incredibly important because then obviously they, of the place they occupy in the supply chain to other firms. So, so I, I think it, my point here is those statistics are probably the healthiest ones you're going to see in terms of quality of data, reliability of data. So, so I would take a lot of signal from, from that report in pulling together your investment strategies or your priorities for what you want to address next. The second part that I quite like from the report, uh, and then you're kind of hinting at it, is how, how they structure the report is super interesting, right? They have four or five different sections. Uh, and the way that they've structured this helps navigate a little bit the, 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 the landscape of what we're facing here, right? So they talk a little bit about at the beginning, and I don't remember if the sections are verbatim like this, so don't hold me to it, but roughly the way they've spread is at the beginning is a little bit of most common attack patterns that they're seeing out there, as you said, ransomware phishing, the collection between the two, and, and I can unpack that a little bit. I think people continue to think that there are different types of attacks. It's not like that. This is a chain that leads to sometimes the outcome being run somewhere, but phishing could or not be involved in the same attack. But anyway, they, they kind of give you a bit of a compass to navigate through what are the most prevalent or likely attacks that most companies should be modeling for. Then they go into an explanation of the role of nation state as a type of threat actor. And, and this is something we could explore a bit more. I think there's a lot of confusion out there as to who's doing this. And what's the motivations and what capabilities do they have and is every nation state russia there's there's a wider there's a wider collection of threat actors that we talk about when we talk about nation states. so it is important to get some more accurate language when modeling for that particular threat so there's a whole section about nation state and the geopolitics of hacking which i find fascinating then there's another section which is more relevant particularly for oil and gas because it goes quite in depth into infrastructure security ot iot and that entire universe of cyber that it's not new. We've been having this conversation for a number of years, but it's certainly growing ahead of the rest of the targets. So, so this is something that it's, it's, it's escalating in terms of importance uh, in, in, in the cyber landscape. And then the last two are influence campaigns, which I think a little bit less, this is more voter suppression or voter influence and Cambridge Analytica like threats. How do you use social media to manipulate public's opinions? It's a whole section on that, which was a very lively debate during the US election and other international elections, as you can imagine. And then the last bit is about resilience. So highly recommend you get to that bit because that's what can you do about it all. Uh, and I think that's something that hopefully again today maybe we might want to spend a couple of minutes. Sorry, it's a bit of an introduction to it, but it's it's a it's a damn good report that I recommend everybody should take a read of. And, and for everyone that's that's online with us, we we will send a copy of that report out after this seminar to you so that you can digest it and read up on the points that Federico has flagged. Federico, there's a, there's a few things in that I'd like to kind of come back to you on. Um, and the first, I guess, is what you were saying. There's a section on on nation state and geopolitics, and and I know I know firsthand from an organisation I was in previously that was a global organisation where we suffered a pretty huge cyber attack. And the, the discussion in the media um, believed it was all to do with Russian actors and it was a nation state issue. And, and, and I have no idea if it was or not. But I know that there's a real fear amongst organisations in when they hear about geopolitical landscape and nation state. It seems to just amplify the risks. Mm. You know, are these real risks for businesses in Scotland that are online with us today? And, and, you know, how do they differ from some of the other threats that you've talked about, the kind of typical ransomware, phishing and so on? And again, yeah. what, what can we do about them? Yeah, no, no, look, it's super. It's a question that I have often with customers when we're doing threat modeling or kind of prioritization or risk to, to lead to investment, that it's very, it's very counterproductive sometimes, the conversation, because when you say China, Russia, I mean, realistically, there's very little anyone can do to fight off a dedicated attack by a nation state that is that well armed, that highly motivated, that has the time and capabilities to do whatever they want, right? So it almost goes to immediately a nuclear option of, well, there's nothing I can do, so I'm not going to do anything. And I think it's important to, to qualify the threats that, that are implied when you're talking about nation states, right? And, and 
again, there, there's there's multiple, there's a there's a there's a collection of degrees here that need to be considered, right? So for example, you have nation states that are commercially motivated and not motivated by kind of the disruption of other countries' infrastructures or the persistence game of getting access to every piece of data in government offices, right? So for example, when you're talking about North Korea, when you're talking about Iran more lately, these are threat actors that, yes, they're a nation state, but a big portion of their focus is to gather money and circumvent sanctions that is preventing them from get further investment, for example. So they use cyber as a way to fund some of their programs by executing, for example, ransomware campaigns on target countries. So on the other hand, then you will have things like China, who's been uh, really attributed attacks around intellectual property theft and much more uh, tracking of populations and personal data has, has been much more their interest. Even though these are all nation states, their their objectives here are very, very different, right? Uh, in a in a more targeted environment, like potentially, and I'm just trying to potential threat, a Chinese threat actor who's interested in this specific piece of data, they're going to focus a lot of attention and resources on that one organization because they want the data that's being held by that organization. Whereas when you're talking about a uh, North Korean threat actor group who's only looking to collect money, they couldn't care less about any one specific organization. They're trying to get as many as they can in order to, to gather funds. So the threat is very different though, even though everything connects back to this idea of a threat actor that is a nation state. So in that case, for example, in latter case, North Korean threat actors will behave much more like commercially motivated financial crime organizations. Same techniques, same, same objectives, right? So not just using the word cyber threat doesn't qualify the risk enough for me to then lead into a what can we do about it conversation. So, I mean, I guess, I guess you know, you could be on the call today or you could be thinking, well, you know, how am I ever going to know if we get hit by a cyber attack, who who has orchestrated it? And, and sometimes we may never know the why. So I guess the focus, the practical focus for organisations is on how do we prevent it? Or if it occurs, which sometimes it might be inevitable, how do we prepare ourselves to be as resilient as possible and to be able to move as quickly as possible could you given your kind of vast experience in helping organizations through this these kind of incidents maybe identify what you think are some of the the the, the best do's and don'ts actually sure. of how you prepare and and how you deal with an incident so so maybe the kind of the positioning before and then the dealing with the incident and afterwards if you can split it out like that i think that would be really helpful yeah, I'll try to, to unpack that into a couple of streams of consciousness uh, and, and hopefully they make sense at the end. Let's see what happens. So, so the first one is, I think there's a lot of, uh, historically organizations have desired to adhere to standards as a way to navigate through those journeys of improvements and, and security posture improvements, right? And that's great. I think standards are great, if not almost uh, something you can't do without because you at some point will be asked to demonstrate your compliance to NIST or the NCSC standard. So choose your poison, right? It's, it's probably irrelevant, but I think standards are great, but what they risk to me is that they're not specific to any one's organization. They're generic, right? They are the same controls to every organization and they're pretty standard. Now they're good practices and you should definitely consider them, but they're not enough. Where we try to start with, with everyone is on top of using a standard framework for, for to educate some of the discussions, it's important to also take a different axis that we call threat modeling and, and the industry calls threat modeling, right? And this is where the organization itself takes a look at, okay, what are the things that are valuable that we hold that someone might want to have access to? I usually start with a question of what is a really bad day for the organization? Forget IT and technology, just tell me about what you think are the three or five worst days that this organization can have. Is it customer data loss? Is it financial loss? Is it reputation? Talk to me a little bit about it. And then we start unpacking the, okay, how can that bad day manifest? And then for somebody to actually execute an attack as you're describing, who do they need to, why, why would they want to do that? Is What is their motivation? Who do they need to be? And then this aligns a little bit to that conversation that we'd like to flash out for customers where they can then say, okay, for these top risks that we've identified, these really bad days, we believe that these really bad days can happen if these conditions are true, then these are the controls we've implemented or not to find when these, these things are happening. So at the end result of this engagement, what you end up is with a pretty great report or source of data that tells you, okay, for these risks, 
these are the things we're interested in finding out when they happen, the symptoms of that risk material. So the fever, the cough, the shakes, that means we might have a flu. So here's the things we need to monitor for in our environment. And then here's the investment in order to, to, to make sure that we have the right data at the right time about these symptoms. Mm -hmm. This is something that I think a lot of organizations haven't done because they've gone through the kind of x-axis of we follow the controls recommended in the standards so we've implemented one of each of these and they didn't necessarily tie up to this control will give us these symptoms we implemented the control because the standard said so so i think this other y-axis brings something else to that conversation and then helps you select how you deploy investment how do you get assurance that you're doing the right things so that's stream number one you want to unplug that yeah, yeah, I'm just going to make a quick comment and I'll, I'll let you go on stream too. Is, so what you're saying is maybe people need to rethink how they approach cyber and, and think about what are their crown jewels in the organisation? What's the data or the systems that they need to and have to protect? And that's a, it's a really interesting point, actually, because every organisation will therefore be different. Um, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And the controls recommended in a standard. For some reason, this idea of you need to kind of look at yourself, you need to make this specific to you hasn't been really surfaced. I would almost like to see that in the executive summary of any framework going, these are just some kind of categories of controls. They say nothing about your individual business risks, not only technology, I would go back more to even grab a law firm, right? So customer matter, the transactions, what are the key business processes that should they go awry? That's a really bad day for you. And then what, how do we put a control around that, whether it's a process or the people or the training or the executives? I think that that's how we invite the, the thinking to, to happen. Thanks. You were going to go on to, I think, stream two. Well, there's a, there's a couple of really interesting uh, statistics. If you look at in the report, uh, if you want to take a note, page 16 of the report has some really cool statistics in Microsoft land. But what, what it was highlighting for me is, and throughout the report, it's peppered sprayed with, here's a huge, enormous problem. Here's something really tiny you could do that starts getting you in a direction of addressing that problem. And I don't think we're, I think we sometimes over egg the solutions in this industry. We only think about the big solutions, right? You need to buy a full SOC MDR. By the way, you should buy one, we sell a great one. But outside of, you, you should buy a great EDR platform. You should, these, these big investment programs, right? And I think sometimes we forget that there's a whole collection of tiny things that we could do. And through that report, they do a pretty good job, but it's kind of, Kind of spread out all over the report so uh, we're trying to pull together a, here's a top 10 things that you could do tomorrow without any investment other than using the tools you have already most likely better so for example in the report one of the things that they really hide highlight is the uh, the need for attackers to compromise identities so we used to think as attackers as zero days vulnerabilities and something that is unpatched and that is still true right so all of those risks we were, were always true, but what the latest round of attacks over the last couple of years have shown is that an attacker can do pretty much nothing if they don't compromise corporate identities as well at some point during that attack chain. So I think a really easy way to start making a dent about the impact that a successful first step can have on you is if you wrap around quite a lot of security around how you're protecting your identities, particularly for moving into cloud. So there's things like multi-factor authentication, conditional access, uh, token keys for VIP accounts or Hayek and executives. These are not things that take money. These are things that might take some time, might take some cultural change. You might have had them in your to-do list forever and you know that, you know why we started that MFA process but I never finished it. Well, actually finishing it might have more of a positive impact in your security posture, not only to preempt an attack, but actually to be able to contain one when it happens than you think. And, and that is that coincides with what we see during instant response. What we see is people are still trying in a very kind of 2000s way to build really strict walls around them, but they're really soft and gooey on the inside. And that soft and gooey on the inside is the killer shot because once there's an attacker that has a first inch, moving laterally, changing privilege escalation, all the things that they need to do to get domain admin, proper control of your infrastructure, is relatively still easy to do, which is kind of embarrassing in 2023. We're still in that state of lack of hardened internal controls. So a little bit of security around identities, massively up in my my wish list for 2023 for organizations and, and i guess you know thinking back to the kind of things that we see qu quite quite common the, the weaknesses are around human hum, human error human conduct phishing is a perfect example of sure. you can have as much 
security in your systems and if somebody clicks on the wrong link um so i guess you know would one of the things that you'd be talking about in terms of the top 10 where it's, it's kind of less about buying big is is it about kind of constant reminders and training of your staff awareness is that is that still well, really important i have a very controversial posture in this one so I'm, I'm, apologies if, if Great, no go i kind of ruffle some feathers but i think so absolutely fishing is absolutely key but if the if if what your statement you just said is true, we can invest all this money, but ultimately we all depending on somebody not clicking on a link, then we failed at our jobs as cybersecurity professionals, right? It cannot be that all controls in an environment can be circumvented by somebody clicking on a link. We've severely failed at the implementation of security controls. We shouldn't be putting that burden on our non-technical users that, by the way, we've invested billions of degrees, but it's all down to you. Good luck on not <laughs> clicking. it. This is just not the way... Sorry, this is very preachy, but I don't believe that that's the right way to, to, to address that problem, nor is it fair to put that pressure on people. There are better ways to, even if somebody clicks, make sure that that has no consequence or that the consequence is limited to, to, to a blast radius that maybe only affects that one individual or even more. For example, you could enforce Microsoft Edge, the browser, with all the controls that come with Microsoft. And again, I don't sell Microsoft, so I'm, I'm not pitching here. My point is there are controls available in most environments already that people don't even know they have. You could prevent them from accessing other browsers like Google, uh, Chrome, who has a lot of access to user land, comes with a lot of privileges. Restrict to edge, restrict to safe links and smart screen, which is all the controls that filter links that are clicked. And then when a click, when a link gets clicked, it opens it in almost like its own VM, that is another tab. So the tabs in edge are completely isolated from each other. You can only affect the stuff in that tab. So from a security perspective, even if somebody clicks after all the training we've given them, the impact and the blast radius of that, that link is just constricted to, to that one tab. So I think there's a lot we can do to help users not carry the entire burden of our security posture because that's uh, unfair. And it's also a, a never ending war, right? So the, yeah. the ability for phishing campaigns to get sophisticated is scary. Lately, we've been seeing things like chat GPT or uh, AI deep fakes that are almost live in phishing. So we've had an incident where somebody got a call from their CEO. This is a live call from their CEO. It turned out not to be the CEO. It was a deep fake on real-time voice. Now, this is not a widespread mechanism yet, but it's going to become as this technology becomes so uh, easily accessible. So our users are always going to be fighting a losing battle here. We can we can put it on them. That, that, that's a really interesting take. And just to, to, to take you back a little bit before we move on to, diff, I've got a couple of different topics I want to explore. You talked about the fact that the Microsoft report has lots of different solutions and, and you're going to try and pull them together um, and, and top 10s. From your perspective, again, a big, a big question, but what do you commonly see the organisations um, do that they shouldn't as opposed to things that they don't sure. do that you recommend they should what do what do they do that's that's wrong or misguided or, or going to cause them more headaches further down the road yeah and, and you did ask me for about I, instant response preparedness and i didn't tackle that question so we can tackle both okay. at the same time so i think a lot of the times organizations are relying on uh, a paper uh, and, and and on policies and procedures and I mean, I come from the pen testing offensive security side of the house, right? So I, I, I have an organic aversion to paper and governance. So that, that's, that might be just a personal bias. But, but the reality is when you're, when you're in a live fire situation, where you're in a threat actor situation affecting an, your policies and procedures and your compliance against ISO or NIST or, is completely irrelevant to the threat posture. And I think a lot of people still have this perception that compliance equals security. And, 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 and that's a risk that people get really... Uh, hurt by during a live incident because they think they had it all done they think they've done it. and i think that lack of i think there's we perceive it to be much more wide in terms of coverage than what it really does and a paper trail is important and it should exist to demonstrate compliance and to demonstrate thinking but it doesn't necessarily impact your real-time day-to-day security posture and, and and i think understanding that would be important the best case is an instant response i walked into organizations for example, particularly in this field in oil and gas, because of their health and safety background, oil and gas firms are usually super mature in their understanding of kinetic risk, human risk. But they think wrongly that because they know about risk, they can translate that into kind of muscle memory for cyber risk. And, and that I found in the times I've worked uh, with customers in the industry is not necessarily the case. But because they have this history in risk management through health and safety, they're very 
I, I dare say almost arrogant to that, of course, we got this, we know how to do risk. And they forgot that there's a collection of different dimensions to think about when talking about cyber risk that are not as maybe predictable or historically known. And it's a, so much more of a moving target. It moves so fast that, that it just requires a different muscle memory. How do you do instant response? How do people behave? We, we normally talk about uh, contextual leadership. So an organization can be very democratic and very static and very governance-based for day-to-day, -day, but in an instant response, we need to really behave differently. There needs to be a lot less people around the table. They need to know exactly what their roles are. They need to have pre-agreed with a handshake. We are going to be different people the day that we've triggered a cyber incident, and this is how we're going to behave. And not having done that, we have found it really hurts the ability to respond effectively and efficiently during a live incident. So I think some of those, some of those items would be no, nots to me. We, we've worked with some organizations who, who've conducted kind of mock incidents um, mm. and some, sometimes unknown to staff that they are in fact mock, sometimes it's clear that they're mock, to actually test in practice what the human response is and, and whether their policies, procedures work. Is that something you've been involved with and that you would recommend? It seems to me that, that from the occasions I've been involved, it was a really because what, what people expected to happen didn't and things that they expected to work didn't and things that they didn't expect to work did. Any uh, thoughts? Uh, on that? Absolutely. Yeah. So testing is absolutely fundamental. And like uh, like coffee, there's different intensities of testing. Right. And this yeah. is where what I would recommend probably going for, for a collection of different things. Go for a tasting menu. Uh, there's things as, as light as a tabletop exercise, which is probably what most organizations will have done. If they've done anything is they sat around the table and they role play the day. It's yeah. useful in that it creates awareness. I usually try to recommend it more for senior leadership and executives. This is a, a great awareness racing exercise where they might realize, oh, hell, I thought we had all that covered and we don't. Yeah. We need to get our ISP on the table. Where is our, how do we contact our ISP or stuff like that, right? Which it prompts some really yeah. good questions. However, the operational benefit of a tabletop exercise is more limited, right? Do yeah. the operational teams really get involved in doing what they would do or are they just putting their best kind of assumption forward? So I think if you're trying to test your actual resilience, like how will you do it with as an organization, there's engagements that are much more active, similar to Appentis, but not Appentis, but where you can simulate a malware attack. It's just a malware that does nothing. Uh, and that really prompts people to behave the way they would because they don't know, they might not know that it's a, it's a test. So there's, there's coffee intensities of how much and what do you test. I highly recommend looking at all of them and then making a plan for maybe you want to do this one once a year, maybe that one twice a year and mix and match a little bit of it over there. But yeah, you're only as good as your muscle memory in this. And this is the point that I always want to make. Your instant response processes, your playbooks, great, fantastic. Uh, and you should definitely be raising awareness. What you want to develop is organizational muscle memory here that everybody really knows what to do almost instinctively because they've done it before. Uh, and and that's, that's what makes the difference between a good day and a bad day during an incident. No, that's that's really good advice. I'm conscious of time. I, I want to just pick up with you briefly around the topic of in cyber insurance, because I know that that comes up in a lot of our discussions with organisations and people today might be interested in terms of, you know, it's probably evolved quite a lot in the last few years. Um, what, what do you think of it? And what if people are looking to to to, to put in place cyber insurance, what should they be thinking of? Because I guess it's a very specific risk benefit analysis for each organization um, as to whether it's worth it but what would you recommend they think about or they look at when when, when they're looking at the options in the market sure uh, this is something we work quite a lot and we as instant responders we work a lot with insurance firms that we're in their panel so when a customer makes a claim we are one of the firms that gets involved in responding and trying to help uh, I think, I think, as you said, the product is evolving and it's a living, breathing organism, even as we speak, right? Uh, and even yesterday, I was posting a link to uh, Lloyd's of England insured uh, that's created now a catastrophe fund in order to de-risk the insurers that are offering products in this space. So, so I think my read on this, and again, this is a personal read based on experience. This product is evolving to the point where I'm not really certain the value in the product is what people believe they're buying. It used to be that the product of cyber was making some outrageous claims because insurers were trying to market grab, land grab as much as they could of the, of the market, right? So they would offer loss of revenue. They would offer payments of all the fees involved in the response and forensics analysis. They would involve loss of profits. There was a whole bunch of promises that were being made in the products that people were buying for relatively low. Now that product's evolved where 
actually they're stripping a lot of the benefits of the product off the product itself because they just couldn't face the the slaughter that they were getting in terms of how many claims they were getting and how disruptive these attacks were and how prevalent these attacks were getting so the probability of a company having an attack is through the roof right and so these these outrageous claims no longer hold water from them to be financially viable to the point that they're now not only trying to get away from paying some of these you might have seen the very public marsh uh, element where they were claiming on their insurance and the insurance said that it was an act of war from russia so act of wars were not covered by and this was just a ransomware attack right so and, and you talked about it for attribution how do we know who's attacking us well this is where attribution will be really difficult if who attacked you will determine whether you get or not paid attribution will become a much more important game mm -hmm. in, in in this in this industry so I guess my, my top three line items would be, this is changing a lot. So simply because you had insurance, don't think that by renewing it, you're, uh, you're gonna be getting the same product that you were getting before. Go look at the decencies and make sure you're getting exactly what you want to be getting from it. If you have insurance, if you're thinking about insurance, make sure you operationalize how you use it. I've walked mm -hmm. into too many instant response uh, engagements where naturally they call us first because you're going through an attack, you call the fire department. If you're going through a fire, you call the fire department, not the insurance firm. The problem with that is the insurance firm might then say, ah, you should have called me first. So I'm not gonna cover anything here. So, uh, because you didn't engage us first, you engaged that firm first. So they might've made the thing worse. So I'm off the hook. So be sure to understand how do we actually use this in a sentence? If I need it tomorrow, do I need to get my instant, and, and this is a recommendation, get your instant response partner pre-authorized by your insurer so that they are enabled to go in and then the claim would actually pay for their time and materials. And the third one is do uh, an analysis. I think there's a residual risk, no matter how much money you invest in defensive and responsive and you have an instant response retainer and you have a sock in there, you have all the bells and whistles. There's always going to be a residual risk. And that's where to me insurance plays, right? Insurance plays. After you've done all the mitigation that you can do, then you can actually look to, to ensure your residual risk. So is the quantification of that risk to me that is important. And I think there isn't a great understanding in the industry of what is that residual risk. So how often, to what size I'm gonna to have to claim it and what am I expecting to get for it? So, so it's all very connected, but I think there is still value in the product. Find a good broker, find a good insurer, find a good product on the market, and then make sure my advice would be, you're really thinking about the size of that residual risk before you go into, into the insurance market. Thanks. They're, they're really helpful tips, I think. And actually, for, for those of you online, our next session um, is going to also have a representative from the insurance sector on so we can quiz them further. Federico, I've got other questions, but I'm going to leave it to the Q&A just now. Um, and I'm going to switch over to introduce Colin to join us. Colin Hume, who's the head of our Bernays Polls uh, market leading IP practice, who has got over 20 years experience in the in data, data theft and, and, and data loss, um, particularly from the internal and also external actors. Um, he quite often is, is the partner who has got stories about breaking down doors with sledgehammers and uh, probably more impressively actually had to charter a private jet during lockdown to go up to Orkney on behalf of a client to secure a site there. So we're gonna hand over now to Colin, who's gonna talk us through um, the inside threat to your organizations and how you can help manage and mitigate that, Colin. Great, thanks. Thanks very much for that introduction, Hazel. Uh, and yeah, this is a very different focus. Uh, uh, Federico has, has spoken very much about the external threat and the external uh, challenges that you, you face when protecting your business. This is, and, and they, they did touch on, Hazel and Federico, Federico did touch on the burden on users to protect your business. Actually, what I'm going to talk about is the users. Uh, I'm just looking at uh, a bad actor within your business, or perhaps some, simply somebody who's uh, not a particularly uh, a malicious intent, but perhaps lazy, or uh, perhaps uh, self-serving reasons why they're going to want to take data from your business. The, the full, there's a full range of reasons and motivations why uh, people do this. I've we've, we've done so many of these. Often we never understand why people have taken what they've taken. Uh, sometimes it makes no sense whatsoever, uh, but, 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 but they do. And it's a, really a, a frequent issue which we're called upon to, to deal with. So uh, any, if you could put the first objective slide up, thank you. Uh, so really this is the overall, the overall focus of what I'm trying to achieve uh, in the, the brief time we've got, I think about 15 minutes to talk, is looking at making sure people are aware of this is an issue aware that 
the, the importance of the assets within your business of information which you should be protecting, taking a, a proactive approach. If, if, if me and my team get involved, it's because probably because a proactive approach hasn't been taken and we'll be dealing with you know, reactively once, once uh, information's been taken. And to understand the enforcement steps that can be taken and fitting with that is, is the, the effectiveness of restrictive covenants and that they should be, they certainly should be, should be considered. So any, if you could move that on. Thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna to touch very briefly on some legal, some legal issues. Uh, co confidential information is, is absolutely a right which can be protected. Uh, and any information which you've got, I mean, Confidential information, it's a bit like describing an elephant. It's difficult to do, but you probably will know it when you see it. Uh, that's the obvious uh, obvious information, which is key to your business that you know that is not in the public domain. That's probably going to be protectable. And if certainly if you've taken steps, uh, steps to protect it. Uh, there's no, importantly, there's no formal registration process. So it, it happens automatically. If you think up a great idea, and decide to keep it under lock and key and it's not out in the public domain, then it's there's a protectable right there if somebody decides to try and take it. Uh, any of the, the next slide is, is just following on relatively new legislation on under trade secrets. There's a big overlap. This, this was actually an, enacted uh, following an EU directive, if you remember those. Uh, and they uh, th this there's a lot of overlap between uh, our confidential information law, which is common law, and and just trade secrets law. The key thing to remember about really about both aspects, about certainly about the trade secrets regs, is that and it's mentioned here is that you, you must have taken reasonable steps to protect the information and to keep it secret. So, if if for this, what one of the key takeaways to, uh, from this talk is to have a look at the information which is in your business and uh ensure that you're you're doing what is appropriate to keep it to keep it secret and to make sure that it's um uh, it, it's locked down if if somebody takes information and it's found that actually you weren't you weren't uh keeping it secret then it's possibly not not protectable at all now when we get called into this uh situations which an employee is taking information there'll be a whole lot of other intellectual property rights that we're looking at Copyright. If someone's actually just copied a database and copied a customer list uh, when you weren't allowed to do that, then and, and of course copying it can be simply attaching a copy to an email and sending it to your hotmail address. Then that's copyright infringement, and so we can we can use that uh, database rights and various other things. The key the key things are going to be trade secrets and and confidential information. Uh, Any if you could move it on, so. That's the, the background is that there are rights absolutely in, 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 in the information of the business. There are absolutely are rights which can be which, which can be protected. Uh, and I just want to touch on, I've got a list of probably 10, for, based on the work that we've done, the 10 things that probably clients regret we hadn't done uh, and perhaps should have should have done uh, before an incident happened. So Enya, if you could move that on, thank you. So, uh, the first five. So identify, I've touched on this really, identify and keep track of your IP and confidential in information. Uh, Hazel and Federico talked about identifying the crown jewels in your business and making sure that they're well looked after. And I absolutely endorse that. So safeguard and restrict access to it. I think what once once we, when particularly look at from a law, law firm's perspective, once we... 20 years ago, once law firms were suddenly putting everything onto uh, complicated uh, IT systems, everything was open, people that it wasn't locked, it wasn't locked down, everyone could have access to almost everything, perhaps HR was always, at least I hope, uh, secure, perhaps finance. But otherwise, coming up from what I'm familiar with, law firms just had open access that if, if, if it's on the IT system, you can go in and access it. Now, certainly following GDPR, there's much more division appropriately much more division of uh, of data so if anybody has uh, so we, we don't have access even within our business we have to we have access within our own areas but we can't just go and look at somebody who's getting divorced or somebody who's having a, a an argument uh, land I just don't have access to that because it's not appropriate 
it's not necessary for you to have that. And you should apply these rules within your, your, your own business. Uh, you should be looking at adequate IT security controls. You speak to, to somebody like Federico and their, their business. They've got amazing uh, solutions here. Uh, you, you just need to apply the, the appropriate ones. There's, we, we'll deal with clients which have uh, documents which we flagged as soon as they're, they're taken from a, a business. We'll talk about if I've got time. Uh, we'll talk about a case, one of the case studies in which that's how we discovered someone was stealing a huge amount of information because it was every time particular documents were removed from the system or alerts sent to the IT, IT team. Uh, maybe, maybe these documents they can be more closely locked down such that you actually need approval to uh, remove them from your system. There's a whole range of different uh, steps that can be taken. There's also steps that, you know, I'm talking about protecting users from themselves. There's more closely monitoring of employees. Uh, there, there's, there's certainly algorithms which can tell, say, what's Colin Hume's normal email pattern? Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's probably fairly similar with some variation. If I suddenly start sending 50 emails to my Hotmail account, I think that there's probably some red flags thinking, why on earth is he doing that? He's never, never done that before. And so there's a degree of monitoring that can go on to whatever is appropriate for your business. You should certainly be looking at your confidentiality procedures and uh, policies, but and, and, and educating your workforce about them. At, at entry, making sure that people are aware that, that these that these exist and that the importance that they that they have, and and making sure that that people have an understanding that you really can't you, you must respect the company's uh, uh, in, information and particularly confidential information. A very typical issue, is classic classic situation, is people are are sending emails with sensitive documents to their um, personal email accounts. And then what they'll say is, ah, but everybody does that. And it, it may well transpire that, that that's how people have worked and typically worked. And if someone's going to show up, a bad actor can show that they had a practice over a year or two, they would send emails to their, their um, say a personal email account so they could work on it at home or work on it on a different device, perhaps to print something at home. Uh, it's a it's difficult for us to go along and say, well, you've done this now just because you're leaving. and I'd, uh, we can and object to it. Very often, these emails are copied to uh, to their line manager or something like that. And if, if they do that, then we're absolutely dead in the water and being able to object because the company has really implicitly accepted that it's okay to do that. So you know, we, we should we, that should certainly be controlled. Uh, and if you can, so the the, uh, the the further five points I want to touch on. Uh, Make sure that your employment contracts are uh, up to date and cover all, all of this. Uh, ensure that you've got uh, the clauses which ensure that anything created is the ownership in it, the intellectual property in it is transferred to you to make sure that you're to, to your business, to make sure that that all happens and that there's awareness of your post termination restrictions. Uh, I, I would suggest that you should be looking at the uh, points here is, is departing employees should be made aware of this. Uh, now, it can be difficult if you only do this with somebody that you're particularly suspicious of, and then it becomes perhaps seen as uh, confrontational or aggressive. And if you can have it as part of your standard employee exit process, that you can just have, a, have them sign a letter confirming that they've actually not done anything uh, and that they've not, you know, that they've uh, they've, they've made sure that any information that they innocently or otherwise have at home has been deleted. And if they sign a letter confirming that, then it's, it's, it's quite helpful if you find out the, that in, in, inaccurate. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk, we talked already just about monitoring employees. And there's, I know there's, there's different organizations have different views on the extent that they want to, to uh, monitor staff. And we, we certainly now have a, a league of, of, uh, of, our, our, all of our printing is monitored so that you see who the top the top 10, the top 50 printers are in our business. And if uh, there's some efficiency reasons, if you find out that uh, partner partners like Hazel and I are, are spending all of our time printing documents, then you might wonder, well, we probably need more PA support. But there's uh, also issues about people who've handed the notice in are suddenly hitting, hitting the photocopier or the printer much harder. That's maybe something that, 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 that 
you should be aware of. And if I've got time, I'll just touch on a, a case study which you know, involved involved that. Uh, obviously, registering your IP and making sure that that that's protected, and making sure that if someone does someone come up with an invention or in your R and D team, you should make sure that that's all properly protected. Because there are plenty of of examples in which uh, employees have gone off and registered the IP out possibly after they've left. If you've not done it, then they may well do it. And and making sure any anyone you're contracting with. Uh, has uh, and that may come into your business and have access to your systems will have appropriate uh, confidentiality clauses uh, in place. Uh, so you should be aware of that. Uh, Amy, if you could move the slide on, please. Thank you. So uh, conscious of time, uh, five minutes. Here are the a list of the, the different remedies which we can do if the worst if the worst happens. Uh, probably. The ranking in in severity uh, and cost as well. I would I would, I would say uh, going from sending someone a letter saying, "Oh, we found out that you've you, you've you've taken and we'd quite like it back if you don't mind." Uh, and and often when we do that, if there is concerns, we can use some of our digital forensics team. And again, people like Quorum can help. Is it get an employee to come in? Uh, certainly, if we are concerned, the employee can come in with their devices. And volunteer them up, and you can uh, be having making sure that everything's deleted and uh, removed from their systems. There's always a risk they've got some other device, they've shoved something under the cloud, and their cloud access is through some new mobile phone that, that they're not going to deliver. But certainly that gives clients some more comfort. Um, court proceedings with or without notice to go straight in for an interim interdict. One of the benefits, and certainly in Scotland, is it's much easier to get a no notice interim injunction and interim interdict. So that is, is often, that will simply be an order which is served on them saying, you must not uh, use the information. If they're a genuine bad actor and they've taken it away and they're, 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 they've got plans to, to use it, and they're, then it may be difficult to, to, a court order may not be effective, but that's certainly what we'd attempt to, to do. Uh, and we have, we've got uh, the ability to, to get the, an interdict to get damages against someone who's who's uh, exploiting your information and also a publicity order if they set up a new business and they're exploiting your information they base their business on it uh, we can get a publicity order to tell the relevant customer base that that they're there that they shouldn't be doing that the most exciting uh, part and i'll hopefully touch on it if, in a few minutes remaining is uh an order under Section One of the 1972 Act isn't isn't as exciting. It's a search and seizure order, a dawn dawn raid. We used to be allowed to do these at dawn. Now uh, we have to do it civilized, usually after nine 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 a.m. And we'll uh, that's a no notice uh, order, which entitles us to go into uh, into people's houses or people's offices uh, with, and, and we're entitled to force entry, which is where the sledgehammer comes in, if if we need to. Uh, and uh, without any warning and secure information which we, we are concerned has been taken. Technically, it's a, we involve a, a court-appointed commissioner, so it's not Bernus Paul taking it away or Bernus Paul's client taking it away. It's actually securing evidence which is required for uh, a, court, a court hearing or a, a court case. If, and, and, but basically, if you think someone is, has been uh, taking huge amounts of your document, your, your, your information or documents, you think they're a genuine bad actor, then this is this is the most popular way of, of being certain that you've secured the information because you can get in there without any 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 warning. And importantly, if you get access to the devices and digital forensics with digital forensic support, you can then find any cloud storage uh, services that they're using and get access and you can compel that they provide you with passwords. Uh, and if they don't, it's a breach of it's a breach of uh, uh, the court order. If they don't give you passwords, there are safeguards. They've got two hours to get legal advice and potentially challenge the, the order. But it's extremely effective. Now, in a couple of minutes, I think I've got remaining. If you could move, move on in, I'll skim over the, the three case studies if we've got time. Uh, this was an example of giving notice before we, we perhaps we set out the options clients didn't want to be heavy-handed and do a dawn raid we instead instead served an interim interdict on someone that had stolen a company laptop with huge amounts of data on it uh, the 
as soon as we, we served it, the response from a, a lawyer uh, was, oh yeah, the laptop was stolen from his, uh, his car uh, several, you know, several days earlier. He produced a, a, a police report that was filed after we served the interim interdict. But in the end of the day, we were never going to get that laptop back. It was going to be hidden very, very securely. We, even if we'd, we'd raided, I don't think we would have got it. So I guess it's, it's, a, it's always an example of these are the risks of not committing to the dawn raid or the search and seizure order and simply somebody just having the opportunity to look at it, look at an order, realise we mean business, but just say it's, say, say it's been stolen, which means we, we, there, would be, there would be a breach of the court order to use the information. But if they've stolen a laptop, We've stolen all the information on it. They're probably going to use it in some way that, that they can anyway. Uh, so it was a useful example of that. Uh, the, ne the next one is uh, so th this is our this is we did have to buy a stitch. I'm, I don't have unfortunately time to tell the full story. A financial services client discovered from documents which had been flagged mm -hmm. that a, a, a consultant that left their business on the Friday they'd forgotten to lock them out of the system. Uh, and yeah, I guess another important thing to make sure that when people leave, you they are properly shut out of the system. He spent the entire weekend downloading documents of huge sensitivity from their 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 systems, and we had to turn up at his house. He wasn't in, and our locksmith decided not to turn up. So uh, a quick thinking colleague did go and buy a, a large yellow sledgehammer so we could ensure that we got access to the. Uh, to, to, to their house. Turns out he was in and he was just hiding. And as soon as we walked up his driveway with our big yellow sledgehammer, he actually let the door, uh, open the door. So it was not as much fun. And the last case study, uh, th this, is, this is a really good example. When we talk about cyber risks and uh, loss of data, it's, we're always thinking digital and, and the risks. Here, someone had created a situation of, of really doing a huge amount of damage to a division of a client's business. And they, they had, huge redundancy, the, the, the manager of the, the division uh, created a redundancy situation for a bunch of staff, for the, 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 those that he, was, that he kept and was planning to leave with. He had a meeting and for that meeting, he printed off every, it was a, again, financial services, he printed off every client with all of their contact details in an enormous list, which ran to hundreds and hundreds of pages under the pretext of, uh, planning to discuss those clients with the, the people that were remaining. So it was a hard copy document and they apparently they, they reviewed it and, and whenever, and it was never seen again. He said it was shredded and we could never disprove that. There was no digital trace. So simply the, 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 this hard copy documentation was taken and we were not able to prove what had happened. So uh, I guess the answer is that, monitoring printing can work but there's a legitimate reason for printing so i think this is one of the few cases that we've been absolutely defeated by because there was no digital trace so taking stuff out in paper form is really hard to 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 to, uh, to stop and i think i'm definitely out of time so that's all i've got to say thank you thank you very much super thank you colin I'm just going to run through very, very quickly um, a couple of the points raised on the chat uh, just to draw everybody's attention to it. So a couple of the delegates have asked about conflicting narrative around in China, but there's not formal requirements from the government yet. And uh, Federico has very kindly put some, some thoughts in the chat there, and I'll let you read those. And likewise, there's a really good question around insurance policies. Would that in itself make you a target? And Federico has also shared some quite disturbing thoughts there about sometimes it, it does make you a target, but a few other point, points as well there. I'm conscious that there may be other points people want to raise, but I know that there's been some um, pre-submitted questions that I just want to very quickly touch on to uh, both, both Federico and Colin. And um, the first... The first is Federico, I think we've kind of covered it actually, but I just want to see if you've got any other thoughts. Um, a question has been asked about any guidance you've got about running a mock cyber incident for an internal IT team. And certainly what you said earlier was, look, tabletop might work for the more senior team, but for the ops teams, it really needs to be something more hands-on. Any other kind of, just very quickly in a minute or so, any other nuggets that you could you could give that questioner? Uh, no, the only, the only 
a point to raise there would be a lot of the times your IT teams are already dealing with incidents. They just don't think of them as such, right? Every time that there's a suspicious behavior in a laptop, there's a malware outbreak, there's an email that's doing something, that's already instant response. So they're all doing, doing something there. And what I invite everybody to do is sometimes instead of writing an instant response and telling people this is how you should respond, it's easier to document what they're already doing because that's the organic way, that's the path they chose to follow. So it's much easier to build on that than to give them a completely new framework. So you don't need to start with hypothesis being massive disruptive incident. You could start with those small behaviors that already have and then build up from there. And, and there is a linked point as well about, you know, thoughts on preparing an effective incident response plan. So just picking up on your thought there, would, would it be right to say that, that maybe from certainly from the IT perspective, they should be looking at how they currently respond to events and then pulling out the steps that they would ordinarily kind of from muscle memory do rather than sitting with a blank sheet of paper and trying to come up with something that, that looks shiny and new, but actually wouldn't be instinctively how they would react? Look, I, sometimes the best incident response plan is, you know, the five SMEs that can help you think through that. And your entire incident response plan is, we would actually get a hold of these five people, put them in a room and let them think through the problem. Instead of trying to anticipate every scenario that you, so if it's ransomware, we do this. If it's phishing, we do that. If it's, instead of trying to outline a playbook for everything, your playbook will be select your trusted team that you know can figure out most problems, put them in a room and give them the authority to operate. That's a great incident response plan for 90, 99% of the organizations, much more beyond trying to anticipate every single little thing that you want to, to have a page 99 for, which serves no purpose. No, that makes complete sense. I'm conscious of time. My last question, both to Federico, you and also then to Colin. Brilliant tips today, some really practical solutions in terms of mitigation of risk and where you spend your time and attention. We're in January, New Year's resolutions. If you could think of a couple of points that, that you would encourage um, kind of these organisations that are represented today, what should be on their New Year's resolutions list or, or what would be on your, your wish list for them? Federico, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, it sounds a bit self-serving, so so please bear with the, this is not pitch, but please have your incident response partners ready to go. So what the, the benefit of engaging with our retainers, so if you're not going down a full kind of SOC MDR, XDR kind of managed service, which is kind of the golden panacea, if you're, if you're not there yet, an easier way to start is with some sort of retainer. There's multiple flexible flexibilities or types of retainers from very, very basic, we're just available with an SLA, but it's guaranteed to, it comes with a lot of the incident response planning and preparations. There's a whole bunch of degrees of intensity, but select them now. Because the challenge is we as suppliers are all getting a lot of customers at the same time. It takes us time to then hire, train, have somebody on the bench ready to respond to those SLAs. So we won't be able to respond to anybody that picks up the phone the day they're having a bad day. And like we are there, every other supplier is there. In fact, behind the scenes, suppliers have offloading agreements where we can help each other respond to a bad day on each other's customers. So, so we as a community are doing everything we can, but we really need customers to engage because when you pay for a retainer, you're paying for that bench, which then means we can have people on standby only being available. Otherwise, we all need to do that as an upfront investment and not everybody's had the luck that we've had to raise so much money from private equity, right? So, so you might be constrained to how much people you have on the bench. So the, the earlier you engage, the better. So that's number one, focus on our retainer, try to find your partner today, have those conversations. That's gonna make your life easier. Uh, the second one, I kind of already said it, which is there's a lot of little tiny things you can do, small missions. Even if you're, for example, if you if you are Microsoft aligned, Microsoft will pay for a lot of partners like me to come in and do those things for you. So that doesn't even need a, to be a financial show from you. So I think focus on the quick wins. There's there's a ton of really good behaviors that you can adopt today, small IT changes that can really make a massive dent. Uh, so So think about those more than just the huge, enormous behaviors. And then the last one, boring, not exciting, uh, nothing to do with Colin's chat, much more kind of mundane, it's attack surface mapping. You can protect what you don't know you have. Uh, so there's, this is a huge part of the industry. It's growing a lot of momentum. You will read it in Gardner reports. It has multiple names. It goes to old asset management, to vulnerability management. Now the new marketing term is attack surface mapping. There's a lot of really good things that come with those offerings. For example, we do a lot of identity compromise monitoring so that we, when we take a customer and, and, and a service like that, we will monitor for identities being sold in the dark web. We will monitor for the indicators of initial compromise that you might never hear about because it's not happening in your infrastructure. And we can only do that if we know every domain you have and every endpoint you have and every VPN you have. The understanding what you're showing to the outside world and keeping track of how that outside world is being discussed in attacker forums 
it's really valuable. And again, doesn't need a lot of change. It's a small engagement. We're not the only one doing it. hundreds of suppliers out there, but uh, it's looking at the outside world a little bit than just the inside world. Uh, so those would be my Brilliant. top three. Thank you. Colin, got a minute I, I, to go. I've got a minute. Sorry. Very brief. I agree with uh, Federico. If you have an incident and you don't have your response team already engaged at a certain level, you don't know who they are, you don't have the numbers written down somewhere. Remember, you'll have no access to IT, you may well have no access to your IT systems. Uh, you, you should have your team ready and ready, ready to go is the, is the first thing. And secondly, really reinforcing the points that I was making is to, to, to raise awareness, have somebody responsible for this, looking internally. So when people arrive in your business, make sure that they're not bringing anything with, with them that you don't, that you don't want to have, uh, as well as right through reminding people about the importance of confidentiality and when, when they're leaving, to make sure that they are aware that that's something that's important to you and make sure that they, they, they agree that they are, uh, they've respected your company's confidentiality uh, when, when they leave. So, awareness. Really, thank, thank you, Federico and Colin, both for your insights and, and sharing the experience. Thanks to all the delegates who've joined us today. Just a quick reminder, we're going to be doing our second of our, of our three sessions on Tuesday, the 24th of January, where we're going to be joined by somebody from Locked Insurance, where we can pick up some of these threads around insurance policies and related matters. Delighted for you to join. We'll send a follow up with the Microsoft um, Cyber Defence Report so you can pick up on some of the threads that Federico was discussing today. But thank you all for your time and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Bye bye.